Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 breathtaking examples of ancient temple art. For countless people, there is nothing left of them after they pass on. Those who know them die and their memories fade. However, the art of ancient temples around the world preserves more than just the memories of souls whom the world has all but forgotten. The artwork is an invaluable look into their lives, their talents, and, perhaps most importantly, their beliefs. These beliefs were strong enough that they were recorded in breathtaking artwork and preserved for centuries. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by India. Sitting on a small island in the northern part of Germany's Lake Constance is an abbey that was founded all the way back in 724. The first abbot was in charge of building a monastery to honor St. Peter, St. Paul, and the Virgin Mary and, according to the story, he had the support of Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne. What started out as a small wooden building became bigger and bigger and bigger, helped in part by its ideal location as a jumping-off point for travelers going between Italy and Germany. These wall paintings are now some of the only remaining examples we have of church art from the period. The works are fading with age but surprisingly well preserved and include eight scenes of Christ healing the sick, along with smaller pieces illustrating famous moments from the Bible, the curing of the man blind from birth, the return of Lazarus, and other scenes of healing. The presence of the beautiful artwork isn't entirely surprising as it dates from around the same era as the monastery which was used in part as a school for teaching the art of manuscript illustrations. In 896, Abbot Tito III returned to Germany after a trip to Rome. He brought with him one of the holiest of holy relics, the head of St. George. Needing to build a church to honor the relic, he built the church of St. George at Abertzell. Throughout its first two centuries, the church had a couple of overhauls and additions including the installation of wall paintings between the 10th and 11th centuries. Number 4 on the list is, Tsodilo. It's so amazingly intricately built and designed that it's said it took the labor of 1,200 artisans and 12 years to complete the temple that stands to the cult of Sayer, the sun god. It was built around 1,250, and one of the legends surrounding its construction is that it was built by Samba, the son of Lord Krishna. Samba had contracted leprosy and, after performing 12 years of penance, he was deemed worthy and was cured by the sun god Sayer. As thanks he built the temple in his honor, the entire thing was created to represent an earthly version of the sun god's chariot, across the north and south sides of the temple are 24 chariot wheels carved into relief. There were once seven horses in place to pull the chariot, only six remain now. The body of the temple itself is decorated in a series of reliefs that tell the stories of the seasons, show the passing of the months, and tell the legends of the sun god. Others show fantastical animals and creatures, exotic dancers, musicians, and rather erotic couplings. The layout of the frescoes tells the story not only of myths and legends but of the tantric practices of Brahmanism and beliefs. Life-size female stone sculptures stand watch over the central shrine while two other smaller temples stand outside the main complex. It was supposedly the work of one master builder named Basu Moharana who left home to oversee and complete the project. Eventually, place he was joined by his son who designed the temple. His father Europe, was unable to finish building it as it was designed and, or as his stone church, built in the 1100s and sitting on the western coast of Norway, is one of the oldest and best preserved temples in the world. Built in the 1100s and sitting on the western coast of Norway, is one of the oldest and best preserved examples of these massive wooden basilicas. Stave churches are built with all the elements of Romanesque architecture, massive columns, impressive arches, and intricate carvings. The difference is that the stave church is made entirely of wood which makes it particularly vulnerable to the elements and the wear and tear of time. On the inside, there are a number of paintings from a renovation that took place in 1601 when the interior of the building was modified and the choir extended. The church is still in occasional use and many of the items used date back to the Middle Ages, including a sculpted wooden pulpit and images of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and Saint John carved into a rude beam.
The church is decorated with a series of intricate wooden carvings. Many show animals interlaced in an abstract knotwork pattern that bring together Viking tradition and Celtic artwork with the relative newcomer to the area, Christianity. The church was built only a handful of decades after Christianity was introduced to Norway between 1016 and 1030. The earliest pieces of the church were from trees felled in 1100. There have been a number of remodels and restorations done to the building over the years, but much of the artwork, like the carved wooden panels, has been preserved. But the second spot is, Germany. Christianity was spreading by the 4th century and in the Roman city of Sopiani, now known as Pex, the worshippers of the burgeoning religion constructed a series of breathtakingly beautiful, and rather ingenious, tombs. This all happened during a period of history when Roman rule was falling and everything was up for grabs. Perhaps most impressive of all is the survival of the 16 buildings that make up the site. While many Christian buildings and monuments were destroyed during the 16th century takeover by Turkish Muslims, the necropolis, and its artwork, still remain. Most of the people who were laid to rest at the site were given burial places and tombs. There are some that have been buried in graves within the chambers beneath the buildings, however, and about 500 graves have been found around the monuments themselves. Above ground are memorials and chapels while the burial sites and tombs are underground. Many of the ancient frescoes in the tombs and mausoleums have been incredibly well preserved, a testament to the determination of early Christians that has lasted through the centuries. Among the most ornate is the Peter and Paul tomb, which is decorated not only with scenes depicting the two saints, but also with images of some of the Bible's most famous stories, Adam and Eve, Noah and the Flood, and Jonah and the Whale. There are also a series of familiar Christian motifs that have remained unchanged over the centuries, such as the dove. Another known as the Jug Tomb was given its name because of the first spine that depicts a cup and a jug to represent the, the Holy Sacrament's vision for the convent are not only being restored but also open to the public. A nearby guest house can be rented, and the nuns that live there today give regular tours of the ancient building, whose founder died 1,200 years ago. The Benedictine convent of St. John at Muster was built around 800 and sits in one of Switzerland's seemingly infinite picturesque valleys. It was founded at the request of Charlemagne and passed to the Benedictines at the beginning of the 9th century, becoming a convent in 1163. The site, which had been built to honor St. John the Baptist, had been painted with a series of scenes that told the story of Christ. Their discovery also helped to fill in some gaps in the history of the evolution of Christian themes and symbols. With Carolingian artwork sorely lacking, the discovery of the severely damaged paintings helped art and religious historians understand how key moments in Christian lore, like the Last Judgment, had evolved. It's also the site of some of the only artwork we have from the Carolingian period. The paintings were originally created when a site was built, and they were painted over in a remodel that was done around 1200. It was only relatively recently that newer additions to the building, like the Gothic ceiling and the tragically whitewashed walls, were removed to reveal the series of frescoes underneath. In addition to the paintings, there are other pieces that would have been installed only a few centuries after the construction of the building and are no less important, such as the statue of Charlemagne dating to 1165 and a relief that shows the baptism of Christ, slightly older and dating to about 1080. The Sun Temple The fifth spot on the list is occupied by, don't condemn individuals for the groups they join. It was very big and exciting news when it was revealed that Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, was a member of the Hitler Youth. It feeds prejudices against the Catholic Church and implies a scandalous secret. Until you realize that at the time, being a member of the Hitler Youth was essentially compulsory. He was not an active member of the group and did not even attend meetings. And rather than reaping the short-term benefits of membership, he was first drafted into manual labor during the war before being drafted into the armed services in 1943, which he deserted in April 1945. It serves to illustrate that we shouldn't judge individuals based on labels.
Number 4 on the list is, Never Let One Man's Whims Dictate National Policy. When the invasion of Poland was begun in September 1939, it was conducted by a military which seemed half-baked, and not yet ready for the undertaking. The German command noted the economic troubles mentioned above, and thought that the Germany Navy and Air Force would be insufficient for a world war. In fact, Hitler and his command began the invasion under the impression that it would not escalate beyond war with Poland. Hitler's reported statement on the matter was that my time is short, in reference to the fact that he was already 50 years old and was allegedly already suffering the ravages of syphilis. So the critical invasion of Poland, which began the war that destroyed the short-lived Third Reich, was carried out to accommodate one man's self-projected lifespan. The same personal whims also resulted in decisions like the Nero Decree in March 1945, which saw Hitler order the destruction of Germany's infrastructure. Fortunately for Germany, Albert Speer had by then learned the lesson well enough to disobey. At the third place we have, sometimes, you just have to rely on luck. There's a prevailing notion that France was taken out of the war so quickly in 1940 because they stupidly sat in defenses called the Maginot Line while the Wehrmacht went around them via Belgium. In fact, the success of the Nazi invasion of France was actually due to the majority of the Allies being farther north in Belgium while the Germans' main attack would be through an extremely dense forest called the Ardennes. This attack plan was the military equivalent of putting everything on one corner in roulette. If the Allies had moved even a token force against them, the Wehrmacht would have been stopped. Because moving through the Ardennes meant using such cramped, unreliable roads over such bad terrain the worst traffic jam known to Europe at that date slash u.r.l, would have happened. The Allied forces would have been able to pick them off easily as they slithered out of the Ardennes, and even retreating would have been ridiculously difficult. But then, the Germans had luck on their side when they needed it most. At the second spot is, forced labor is terrible for those in power as well. People subject to forced labor often worked elaborately against the Nazis' interests. Taking away people's freedom will generally drain their will to live, and therefore their fear of death, so they'll try to get revenge any way they can. The Jewish Virtual Library states that there are numerous examples of slaves deliberately making defective products. The punishment for this was hanging. Even the desperate 1944 V-2 missile bombardment of Great Britain was so badly assisted by its forced labor that this punishment was inflicted 200 times out of every 10,000 works, and as many as a third of rockets slash u.r.l, that actually hit the targets did not explode due to sabotage. Obviously the evil dehumanization of slavery is the worst part, but anyone inclined to use or condone slavery, directly or otherwise, probably would be more concerned with the bottom lines than the ethics. And finally, at number one, even the founder of the master race concept didn't really believe it. Of course the most significant act of the Third Reich was the mass murder of undesirables in the final solution. But there was always the issue of quantifying what exactly a Jew was in the 1935 Nuremberg laws that dictated Nazi racial policy. 
Ultimately it was decided that personal religion or parental religion wasn't as important as your grandparents' religion. So even Catholic priests and Protestant ministers were listed as racially Jews because they had at least three Jewish grandparents. It effectively could not have made less sense, but as Hitler said, if Jews had not existed, they would have needed to have been invented. So even back then, people were aware that these views were nonsense. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more then please hit the subscribe button.